Lord, have gathered together as a group of Google Janas here at the G4 Mission base here in Hyderabad to study your word on on what is becoming an increasingly common experience in the lives of Google Janas, romantic rejection. I pray that you will speak to us. I pray, Lord, that we will unlearn the things that we have learned wrongly and learn the right things in the right of your word. I pray, Lord, that we will give every area of our life, including our romantic life, to you so that we will learn to please you in everything that we do. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Okay, this is from a popular movie scene. Uh, okay, Vijay returns from an army station. Parents receive him. They take him to see a bride. Okay, the girl's dad stand, who stands below the flat says, where is the mapalai? Where is the ma where is the bridegroom? Okay, the boy's dad says, "This is the this is the mapalai. This is, he's in army army dress." Okay, the girl's dad says, "Looks like he has come straight from a battle." Okay, and then he says, "Before the good time ends." Okay, this is not uh, this is not a Christian uh, matchmaking ceremony. Okay, before the good time ends. Okay, we must see the girl. So so that's why we came straight. He came from the station, and we are driven straight to see the girl. And the girl enters and she serves a drink to everyone, including the boy, Vijay. And the girl's dad says, can we ask the girl to sing? And then someone says, uh, the, the, for the, the kind of dress the boy is wearing, the only song that will be appropriate is Janagana Mana. Okay, and then the girl starts to, the girl and boy, the eyes start to uh, meet. Okay, uh, and then uh, the girl starts to scan the boy from the head to foot and as she brings her eyes to the foot she sees that his the boy's boots is actually covered with slush and then a, a smile turns to a frown and then it smile again and then the boy tries to hide his shoes okay the boy tries to hide his shoes okay. and as the boy's family takes a ride back on the on a mumbai taxi the dad asks okay what da i mean are you happy with the girl uh, you know, obviously they've been very anxious to. He's come on a holiday from a from the, from the army, so he wants dad wants to make sure that he likes the girl, and they go ahead with the wedding. And then the boy says, "Can I have the girl's home number?" And then the they they give the number to him, and he 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 dials the number. The girl's dad picks up, and he says, "Tell me, Thambi." And then he and then the family is making noise, and then they say. Don't make noise. Mapalai is speaking, or the bridegroom uh, is speaking. So let's let's listen to what he says. And then he says, "Tell me." And then he says, "The the, the boy says, uh, sir, your 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 daughter is good and beautiful." And uh, the ladies in the car they start giggling. Uh, but my taste and her taste are very very different. And now the uh, the ladies in the car, that is Vijay's sisters, are very surprised. I'm not sure if our personalities will match. I'm sure your family will find a better groom for your daughter than me. Don't get me wrong. And he hangs up the phone and his father's and his dad says, what is this? And then one of the sisters of this guy says, in this lifetime, with an attitude like this, where you're rejecting every marriage proposal, you're not going to get married in exasperation. The father asks, can you tell me one reason why you don't like this girl? And Vijay talks about three reasons. He says, her hair is long. She's going to take a long time to get ready. And then she says, I, she, she looks like a, a girl who's going to get scared for everything, maybe afraid of cockroaches and, uh, and lizards. And then he says, uh, this girl looks uh, to be like, a, it's like a typical village girl in a, in a traditional dress and all. And then the, the movie scenes shows that it's, that's absolutely not true. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Now, it, this is, that was meant to be a, uh, 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 this movie scene which I narrated from the movie Topaki. Uh, also, you know, it was it was released in Telugu, and I, right now, uh, uh, Ajay, uh, one of the Hindi actors, is also you know, they are make, remaking it in Hindi. Not Ajay, not Ajay, they've been somebody else. Ajit, some some forget. Akshay Kumar is acting, uh, to, uh, shooting for it for in the Hindi version. Okay, now a popular movie scene. Okay, which uh, I I understood, I read somewhere that this movie made 180 crore business. A popular movie scene, you know, is actually presenting this uh, this scene where a girl is rejected by a boy in a lighter way, like a joke. But for a girl who has been through it, 
or a boy who has been through it, that's not a joke. A, a, a movie scene might try to make it for the purpose of entertainment, like seem like a joke. But when somebody romantically rejects you, when somebody romantically uh, discounts you or dumps you, as they say, uh, you know, maybe uh, sends, you know, uh, Google, Google generation increasingly popular way of ending a romantic relationship is through SMS. That's what I read, you know, they send an SMS. And uh, the way a Congress MP's wife's romantic relationship with his wife sort of ended, the starting point was a Twitter argument between uh, his wife and the woman he was supposed to be having a friendship with or an affair with or whatever with. It all began in Twitter or SMS. Uh, that So it, it's not, it, it's so horrible sometimes uh, the, the Sunanda Pushkar, the woman who committed suicide in a five-star hotel in Delhi, uh, was so stung by romantic rejection. I can I can say that she sort of ended her life, or something happened terribly, and she was found dead. This uh, beautiful Kashmiri woman of 50 plus in her third marriage, so stung, so so hurt by romantic rejection. So it's not a joke. Our movies might try to make it like a you know like a joke, but it's not a joke. That's the first thing I, I that, that's how I want to begin with. Now, uh, so how do we handle it? How do we handle romantic rejections? Okay, now I have uh, seven basic points here and uh, they're all from based on God's word with a little bit of practical wisdom and also some things which just come because of my life journey as well. So it's, uh, I'm not giving you an acronym this time. I'm just giving you seven points. So, uh, okay, let's, let's listen to them. First one, some, okay, some handle rejection by not giving a chance for rejection. Okay, this is even, it's, it's actually, you can call it the zeroth point. Some handle rejection by giving it, by giving no chance for rejection. And they, and they think they are very smart. They think they are very smart. So that is why, you know, I'm especially addressing uh, maybe people who are on the wrong side of 30 or, uh, or uh, no, it's not a wrong side. Every side is right side if you're a believer. Okay, okay, they're, you're growing in age, but yet you don't want to think seriously about your romantic life. So, uh, some, a, a, okay, if your par if parents start to propose a girl for you or a or a boy for you, you say, no, no, no. And then parents may say, okay, you marry whatever you like and you don't want to choose yourself. And this is especially a, okay, a, a, a boy problem in, as such because it's, it's still a tradition. The boy proposes to a girl. But now I want to, I want us to read a portion of scripture, which is like a basis for this entire study. Uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Apostle Paul uh, was a very practical pastor. He addressed various issues, including the issue of marriage. He didn't only talk of spiritual stuff. That's why we in the Bible study, we, we not only do Bible books, but we also talk practical stuff. So here, here he's talking about widows and uh, what they should be doing with their life. First Corinthians chapter 7, okay, uh, verse 39. First Corinthians 7 verse 39. Would you read it, please? A wife is bound to her husband. A wife is bound to her husband. As long as he lives. As long as he lives. If her husband dies. If her husband dies. She's free to marry anyone she wishes. She is free to marry anyone she wishes. But only if he loves the Lord. But only if he loves the Lord. I have the NASB. It says, uh, "Wife is bound as long as a, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives." But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Now, in this passage, some of you have heard me say this, is the only non-negotiable biblical condition for marriage. Okay, when you work in a corporate company, there is something called NNB. Uh, I worked in a corporate company for some time, a couple of corporate companies. Uh, so I, I understand this uh, from first-hand experience. NNB, non-negotiable behavior. So if I was speaking to a customer and the customer uses abusive language, I cannot abuse them back. If I abuse them back, that is non-negotiable behavior. I'd be sent out of the company. My badge would be taken off and I'd be walked out of the out of the office immediately. I would lose my job. Now, in when it comes to choosing life partner, there's only one non-negotiable condition. What is that? As a believer, 
you marry another person. And uh, here, of course, the, the, the context is uh, widows. But the uh, moment a widow, uh, a woman, a woman loses a husband, she's a single woman. She's a single person. So what is God's rule for single persons? They can marry anyone. Literally anyone. Younger than you, older than you. Okay. Uh, anyone but in the Lord. Taller than you, shorter than you. Okay. Now, of course, some of you are raising your eyebrows. Okay. Obviously, a girl cannot marry another girl. The Bible doesn't support lesbian relationship. A boy cannot marry a boy. The Bible doesn't support homosexual relationship. Okay. Now, apart from uh, uh, conditions like you can marry anyone whom she wishes. So here is the Bible is actually is, is especially talking to mature believers. I'm not talking to uh, and this message is not addressed to my son who is in a fifth standard. Okay. In a school. So uh, he, he can't go up to class tomorrow and say, okay, the Bible says I can marry whomever I wish, but only in the Lord and, and look at a believer girl in his class or a Christian in his class and say, okay, I'm going to get married to this girl. So let me start dating her from tomorrow morning. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking to mature people, you know, people with a job, people whose parents are talking about marriage. Okay. And, and it's, it's time for you to choose. You know that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so what does the Bible say? Paul sort of says, okay, like somebody, okay, you might sound very spiritual, Lord, show me your will for my marriage. Show me your will for my marriage. I give you my will, Lord, you choose for me. God says, thank you very much. I give the will that you have given me back to you. And with that free will, you choose a girl. Because the Bible says, whomever you wish, but in the Lord. Now, when the Bible is so clear, you know, there are so many young men, especially. And my wife and I have been youth ministry. We, uh, you know, oftentimes we get requests. Not that I'm, uh, uh, sometimes I oblige. Sometimes some good things have happened because of we have acted on those requests. So what we, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, this is the common scenario across cities, uh, pan India. Okay. Okay. A guy will spot a beautiful girl in the church, a good looking girl who is also godly. And then they will say, they'll come and ask uh, uh, Anna Akka, uh, and they'll say, why don't you go and ask if, I, if that girl would be ready to get married to me. Now, I said that there's nothing wrong in doing it. But the Bible says, no, it, it, that is something which you can do. But why are you not doing it? You're afraid of rejections. So that's why I said that some people handle rejections by not being, they're so scared of rejections, so horribly afraid of rejections that they will not even try to put themselves in a uh, in a place where they could be rejected. But I think uh, uh, we must not do that. We must not do that. I, as I go forward, I will talk about more uh, things as to how we can handle rejections. But I think I don't think that is that is necessary at all. Okay. The second thing. The second thing. Okay. Now you uh, maybe your parents proposed a girl for you, a boy for you, and the person rejected the proposal, or the 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 family rejected the proposal, the girl rejected the proposal, the boy rejected the proposal. Understand this. Secondly, God does not reject you. God does not reject you. Now turn with me to a Bible story, uh, jumping from Genesis 29. Genesis 29, and uh, there we see the. Uh, the story of uh, Jacob and uh, Leah and Rachel. Okay, Jacob loved Rachel, but actually had to marry Leah. Okay, now the Bible says in Genesis 29, 17, Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Okay, Rachel was Bible's Answer to Kajal Agrawal. Okay, if I can use that term. In fact, she was, the Bible very clearly says, beautiful in form and appearance. Okay, she was a beautiful girl. Okay, now, but Leah's eyes were weak. The Bible doesn't say she was ugly looking. Maybe there's some problem with her eyes. That's all. The Bible, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a description about her eyes. Her eyes were weak or I don't know what exactly her, uh, the condition of her eyes were. Now, but if you read that story, the verse 18, Jacob loved Rachel 
and then uh, he was willing to work for Rachel and those uh, seven years he worked for Rachel looked like seven days they just the time flew because he was so much in love with Rachel and but he was also uh, the eventually he married who first Leah okay and in fact the problem would not even have started if he had talked with his wife on his first night but this guy was so busy beginning the business it looks like he didn't even talk with his wife or where there was no lighting I don't know what the problem is now I don't know only in heaven I'll know now uh, but so he uh, for, for, be for reasons best known to him okay he had the first night and he understood only in the morning that the girl he slept with was not the girl he loved in fact which means they threw out the sexual act they didn't talk which is actually a travesty because sexual act is supposed to be uh, you know something which you give to the other person and uh, you seek the preference of the other person and not your own selfish uh, selfishness okay I won't go into that because that this study is not about that now but then he uh, eventually married Rachel so he ended up having two wives again it, it, this is not the ideal situation this is against the original plan of God because God created one Adam for one Eve but anyway he's living with two women and his and his first wife you know the Bible says he really didn't love her and uh, and, the, and probably the reason was her eyes were weak or probably the reason was Rachel was second wife was more demanding or whatever it is Leah was rejected and what is what happens what happens what does the Bible say God look at verse 31 can you read that for me please because Leah was unloved but because Leah was unloved the Lord let her have a child the Lord let her have a child while Rachel was childless was Rachel was blindless am I saying every couple who don't have children you now God has closed the home of the woman no but in this story we know for sure 100% why Rachel did not bear children? Maybe she was stopping her husband from loving her first, her, uh, first, uh, his right. first wife. I don't know what the story is. I, I was not there in the uh, in the home to observe many things. We have only some clues in God's word. Now, but God took the side of who? Leah. Leah. I want to tell you something. If you are rejected, okay. If you are romantically rejected, and that too very unfairly rejected, God takes your sign God takes your side the God of Leah is not dead he's alive and he's the same God and and he takes the side of those who you know those who are hurt from romantic rejections now sometimes we think of God as uh, okay uh, okay God uh, why will God reject me if I murder somebody why would uh, why would uh, why would God hate me? Uh, why would God? Uh, you know, we think of many many big big things uh, when we think of why God should reject us. Now, God can reject you for actually uh, causing someone for for putting somebody in a situation of romantic rejection unfairly. In fact, that's why God moved away from Rachel and in fact took the side of. Leah. And then the other side of the story. Now you might be crying and you might be wondering is there anybody in this whole wide world who understands what I'm going through because this boy you know uh, I'm talking about an arranged marriage setting where you know you probably dressed up and you decked up and you served coffee with the boy and the boy rejected you for no apparent valid reason. Okay there are some valid reasons why some you know in fact you may have to uh, reject even after so many things have happened including that uh, pen Parthal, as we say in Tamil, or the uh, what, uh, Peli Chuplu, as we say in Telugu. Okay, Th there can be reasons to reject. Uh, maybe if the family have uh, told lies or half truths, th there are some reasons, or some 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 things from the girl's past that come up and uh, which was not revealed before. So there are, there could be valid reasons, but without any valid reason, maybe especially assigning uh, uh, physical beauty reasons. In fact, that's the context here. That's the context. Here. The context here is. Uh, Le Leah had weak eyes. Leah had weak eyes. Now, uh, so what the Bible clearly says that God took Leah's sight. Can we turn on the light? This light, please. This light is right there. Please. Welcome. All the lights, all the lights. All the lights on. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, what's the second lesson? When you're rejected, God. Remember, God does not reject you. 
In fact, uh, coming to the New Testament in John chapter 6, verse 37. Shall we read that passage, please? John 6, 37. It's a powerful verse. So I'm giving you one verse from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. John 6, 37. However, those yes. the Father has given me will mm. come to me, mm. and I will never reject them. I will never reject them. So, in fact, this is a general statement. Jesus will never reject anybody based on appearance or background or uh, the sins they have committed. You know, he is always, he's always, he's always accommodating. Okay, he always wants you to come to him. His arms are so open wide that if you will come to him, he will sweep you in his arms. He will sweep you in his arms. But he is not going to leave you like that. Okay, if you are coming to him in sin, he is not going to leave you like that. He is going to give you power to overcome that sin. Okay, but at the same time, uh, you know, I was into a, getting into a discussion. Uh, you know, some of you have read my article on Esther Anuya uh, uh, the, on my Facebook wall, on, my, on, on our ministry page, Google uh, G4 Mission page. So I got an inbox message from my, uh, basically what I suggested in the article is, the guys who have perpetrated the crime against Esther Anuya, okay, if they repented, you know, Jesus would forgive them and they can get to heaven. They may go to jail on this earth, but they'll get to heaven in eternity. No, for somebody, you know, that was a big scandal. Uh, in fact, I didn't get into a long discussion, but I, uh, with that person, but, but I understood that this was, uh, this was deeply troubling. Did I mean what I wrote? Exactly. You can commit a crime a billion times more worse than that. But if you will come to my Jesus, he will not reject you. That's the gospel of grace I preach. But he's not going to leave you like that. But you need to change. You need to repent. And his love will change you. Okay, now the context here is romantic love. Which means, okay, you're hurting and you think this girl, okay, this girl has rejected me. Okay, now uh, maybe let's say that uh, Jerusha has rejected me, but Jesus will embrace you. Let's say Christina has rejected you, but Christ would embrace you. So forget about it. You know, you, and that's all needs to matter to you at that point in time. You know, I, I don't know if this brings any comfort to you, but I think it should bring comfort because the God who made the whole world, the infinite God, the creator of the whole universe, the biggest person on this earth says, I love you. In fact, what? how would you feel if a, if a, if a pretty looking lady, okay, let's say, uh, okay, uh, when we talk about 50 years and above, still pretty, uh, people talk about Sri Devi, people talk about uh, Hema Malini and all that. Let's say, uh, you know, Hema Malini or Sri Devi comes up to you and says, you look good. In fact, I love you. You know, you, won't you feel a little bit of, a little bit of high? Now, I'm, I'm talking about a God who made every beautiful person, every beautiful woman on this earth. And he says, I love you. It doesn't matter who rejected you. I love you. So, you know, that, that helps us at that time when, when we go through romantic rejections. Now, thirdly, now understands, understand, third, third reason, uh, third thing that we need to keep in mind when, we, when it comes to handling romantic rejections. Understand there are biblical reasons for someone to reject you. Now, I'm talking about an arranged marriage setting. For example, there are two believers, okay, and uh, say a proposal is made either, let's say, through an email or through a Facebook or through a phone call or through a, uh, through, uh, through a third person, you know, a proposal is made from one family to another family and both the families are believers, okay. Biblically, there is no, uh, in fact, uh, there's actually, there is no reason for, uh, these are two believers, arranged marriage, okay. But let's, let's say you're the girl and, and you hear a, no, from the boy's side. You think, okay, I'm a Christian, he's a Christian, I'm a believer, he's a believer, I work in a tech, a tech field, he also works in the tech field. Okay, both of us, economic background is same and many things match. Okay, and then then, then you hear a no. Uh, you, in fact, uh, you don't have to, sometimes people take that to heart. When, whenever they get a romantic rejection of any kind, even in a range marriage setting, people get it, take it to heart. Understand there are biblical reasons why a, a boy may not say yes to a proposal. In fact, I... Did not say every, yes to every romantic proposal I got. Uh, I said, I had to say no. Why? Okay, because I understood from the Bible, you know, when I chose to when I choose to marry a person, I must marry not only a believer, but somebody who has the same passion for the Lord as I have. Okay, 
Because in the Bible, I read about, uh, you know, from the Old Testament, we have the example. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 22, chapter 23, and we're not going to read that passage, but 2 Chronicles 22 and 23, we read about a priest called Jehadiah. Okay, and Jehadiah was a priest in a time of, uh, in, in Judah's history where Jehoiada, okay, how will you pronounce it? Jehoiada or Jehadiah? Okay, J E H O I A D A. How are you? Uh, Jehoda. Okay. Now he's a priest. Now we read about him in Second Chronicles twenty-two. <laughs> now he was a priest in Judah's history when not even uh, one. There's only one baby from David's line was alive. Okay, and that was King Joash, baby Joash, and his wife. Her name was Jehosheba. Now. She, in, in, with the help of a nurse, with the active cooperation of her husband, they worked together to save the last male child from the, from the line of David. Why? Because God's promise is that a, a baby from David's family will rule Judah forever and forever. Now only one baby was surviving. So here is a husband and wife working together to build God's kingdom, do the work of God. So which means... You know, uh, the Bible doesn't record uh, uh, how these two met and got married. But I do understand they had a passion to build God's kingdom together. Okay, now uh, on the other hand, we have Lot and Mrs. Lot. Now, Lot, uh, he wanted to run away from the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, a city famous for uh, the sin of homosexuality. God decides to send rain on that city and God asks him to run away from that city. Lot ran, but his wife wanted to turn back. To have one last look at that city. Probably she wanted to continue staying in that city. I don't know why she didn't want to run. But you know what happened to that marriage? That marriage ended because Mrs. Lord became a pillar of salt. Now you need to choose what kind of, you know, you don't want to marry somebody like Mrs. Lot. But you want to marry somebody like Jehosheba. Or, uh, you know, you want to marry somebody like Moses. Uh, I, I think I've talked about Moses and Zipporah. When God wanted to kill Moses, his wife exactly knew why God wanted to kill her husband. And she rectified the situation. And uh, somebody had to be circumcised. The baby had to be, baby in the house had to be circumcised. Or, so immediately Zipporah circ circumcised the baby and God's anger withdrew. So here was a woman who exactly knew why God was upset with her husband. So I'm, what, am I, what am I saying? Look for somebody with the same feverishness that you have uh, for the Lord as you have and get married to that person. Now I can honestly tell God when I married Divan, that was at the top most personal uh, thing on my list. Now uh, I come from a caste which is so stubbornly, one, uh, most of the time wants to marry within itself. Okay, Ivan was not from my caste, but I said, Get that, throw that into the dustbin because that's an unbiblical uh, thing. Okay, then what, what attracted me was even before I, no, even before uh, she met me, she had a made, she made a commitment to, to serve God full time in one of the camps she was part of in our school. Of course, I also made a commitment like that when I was still in school in another camp. Okay, so that's one thing, you know, that's one thing. In fact, I could not believe when I first was talking to her, a, a, a beautiful girl, a godly girl, had actually committed for full time ministry. So that was that initial thing. In fact, at that point in time, I was not even thinking. Of, I, I was not even in the in the zone to think whether this is girl fair or dark or tall or short. No, those things were not even at the top of my mind. What was on top of my mind was here was a girl, okay, who has committed for full time ministry, okay who is coming to the fellowship I go to. In fact, I attended a fellowship in Chennai called Students for Jesus and she used to come. And that's when uh, I also started getting proposals through my parents and I knew I had to make a choice soon. So that's that's what led us together. Now, now, so, but at the same time, I also mentioned that I rejected some proposals. I came, I got. And the reason, you know, the reason is maybe I felt, I may be wrong there, only eternity, uh, eternity, uh, I'm not judging anybody. But, the, 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 the biblical thing, reason that came to my mind was, okay, I must marry a girl who is as feverish, uh, who is as feverish for Jesus Christ as I am feverish. So that's the, that's the thing. So don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. For example, I would, God will not call everybody to come into full-time ministry. 
so if a full time minister is proposing in marriage for you and uh, and you are not inclined to come into full time ministry and you reject the proposal that full time the boy call for full time ministry should not get offended oh this girl rejected my proposal because that is a biblical a biblical reason has been used for rejection so that's a, that's another thing uh, in fact uh, i read this from the life of dr ravi zakaria he in, he went to a country correct me if i'm wrong was it cambodia when he was a, still a young man he went to cambodia to preach for he stayed there many months and he started preaching in one of those uh, countries uh, uh, no southeast asia asian countries and he, he worked with a particular denomination the denomination uh, sent him as a sort of a missionary to do a long uh, stay there for a long time and preach but uh, by that time he had some kind of association with magi and i remember reading in his autobiography that ravi zakaria did not want to even formally uh, get engaged to her because he knew if he went there and preached his life you know he knew there was a certain risk to his life in fact he would he narrated a story where his life was almost uh, taken off by terrorists when he was in that trip as a single man preaching the gospel in that country why because the last thing he wants to do is to get engaged to a girl and go there and get killed in the mission field and then this girl is you know left thinking about him for the rest of his of her life so, so when why did he not get engaged to her probably saying thinking saying eh, okay at this time if i get engaged to you okay if i go there and die that's going to live a long scar no but magi at that point i'm sure understood ravi sakre said a biblical reason to postpone the engagement so you don't take now look at look at things objectively don't take things personally maybe there somebody had an objective reason to say no okay is it because, so is the okay suppose somebody uh, you said some, because uh, okay and the boy wants to do full time ministry girl doesn't want to do full time ministry so the girl rejects the boy's proposal is that does that make the girl less spiritual no the girl is fulfilling the call of god on her life so nobody needs to feel bad or less spiritual okay but we need to look at things objectively okay let's move on here and uh, the fourth reason okay the fourth thing that you need to keep in mind God foresees the danger if you will marry X, Y, or Z. Sometimes, now God will speak to you, and when you go to Him in prayer, when you are romantically involved with a person, that person may be a half believer, full unbeliever, or a believer but not in the same feverishness as you are. Whomever you may it may be, and God is speaking to you that you should not actually give your heart to that person, but still you are rebelling. still you want to continue that relationship still you are meeting that person still you are talking on the phone still you are carrying the romantic relationship forward you know what god does he does what is described in hosea chapter 2 5 and 6 can you read that please hosea chapter 2 5 and 6 hosea 2 5 and 6 powerful verse in fact uh, i remember being on a chat with a particular person then mother is yes shameless prostitute okay and became pregnant in a shameful way uh huh she said i will run after other lovers i will run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and water i will sell myself for food for food and, and water for water for clothing of wool and linen and for the olive oil and drink for clothing and olive oil and what not okay for this reason i will fence her in with thorns for this reason i will fence her with thorns with thorn bushes the context is you know the woman is israel and israel is uh, actually married to god okay it's a pictorial imagery not literally speaking but spiritually speaking but israel is rejecting god and going behind other gods which is like adultery because other gods you know attract her more than other gods attract her more than yahweh and the other gods are giving her uh, giving israel linen and uh, and food and uh, oil and what not so out of the attraction out of uh, temporary attraction israel is deserting the true god and going behind false gods israel is leaving her husband and going behind other lovers and what does god do here he fences her in he puts a block in her path God puts a block in the path of Israel. So how do we handle romantic rejections? Okay, you know, uh, uh, 
we understand that God foresees the danger if we marry X, Y, Z and God hardens the heart of X, Y, Z so that X, Y, Z itself will say no to your proposal. Because you know, God knows, you know, despite you speak, he's speaking to you, you've been disobedient. And you, and you still want to pursue this relationship. So what does God do? He loves you so very much. He hardens the girl's heart or the concerned boy's heart. And that boy says no to you. And probably you're, you're crying and you feel miserable. You're thinking of suicide and you're so so sorry for what has happened you're crying you're making your pillow wet and uh, and you're saying lord why did this happen to you but you know what god says you will cry for a few weeks but i don't want you to cry for a lifetime because that's what will happen when you marry that person and not only that you'll be away from my will now uh, sometimes now when I, I when i say this I, I should be very careful sometimes god allows you also to go and marry the person of your choice Okay, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do that all the time. But sometimes he hardens the heart of that person. He hardens the heart of the person so that the other person says no. Now, I can, I, can, I can give you two examples for this. One, Billy Graham. Billy Graham, when he was in college, okay, he loved a girl called Emily, Florida, Florida Bible Institute, I think, if I'm, if I'm correct. Now, Billy Graham was so head over in heels in love with this girl called Emily. And uh, uh, when the going rate was 25 cents for a corsage, it is a ring, corsage. Okay. Billy Graham bought a 50 cent corsage for her. You know, this is 1940 or 1950. But she still chose Billy's best friend. She rejected Billy and chose Billy's best friend. Why? Because God saw the end from the beginning. Because God knew in the whole wide world there wouldn't be a better choice to be for the for the position of wife of Billy Graham than Ruth Bell Graham, a woman who raised, stayed at home and raised five godly children, one of which is Franklin Graham, who came to our city and preached the gospel to over eighty thousand people two or three years ago. So powerful. Okay, a woman who stayed back and raised godly children, a woman. Who, who, who was Billy Graham's best critique always. Okay, a woman who helped Billy Graham be stable and be so down to earth and so humble. A woman who kept Billy Graham so humble, so much so, you know, once he told a reporter, you know, uh, uh, he would ask God, the first thing he'll ask God when he reaches heaven is, why did you choose me to be the preacher who preached in person to the maximum number of people in all of history? Why did you not choose somebody else? A woman who kept him so humble. So, you no, know, but how did God, how did God do it? He hardened Emily's heart so that she would like somebody else. Now, when I, there was a time in my life when I thought a particular girl was God's will for me and I was so, using all the creative talent that I had, you know, writing letters and, you know, poems and, and you know, expressing my love for her. And I would not forget the day when I was in, still in Bible college when I got up. Uh, envelope and when I opened the envelope was all torn pieces of a of a paper and I thought the paper looks familiar oh. <laughs> I woke up three o'clock in the morning and sat down and wrote poems for that particular girl on this paper now that has come in that's sent that's couriered back to me in torn no I, I was if I told you I was happy I was praising God no I was not praising God my heart was like that, you know, torn into so many pieces in that paper. Then it took me some time. Then I went back home and... Uh, then and, I uh, to write in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back to the next book. <laughs> not yet, not yet, you know. That's where, uh, that's where, you know, my wife even gets me wrong. I was really hurt. You know, in fact, no, you should have seen me how hurt I was. Then I, I had some baggage which related to this in my house. As I went to my I grew up in Vellore. I went, there's a moat around well, moat uh, uh, around the fort, there is a water body. I went and I threw everything, every reminder, every photograph. In fact, uh, I ours was, I mean, I'm not talking about a physical relationship I had with somebody. And I, I just thought that this particular person could be a, a possible life partner. I mean, a life partner for me. And I felt it was God's will. And, 
In fact, I am no patch on Billy Graham, but even Billy Graham writes in his autobiography, he was so sure Emily was God's will for him. So sure. Okay, and he was, I was, even I was very sure. But then, but the, what is the only way God, and God at that point in time, he knew that Evangeline would be the best life partner for Duke. Okay? The only way he's going to have, that's going to happen is, he's going to harden the heart of X. Harden it so much that she would actually tear up all the love letters I wrote to her and courier it back to me. So, I hope you're with me in this this reason I'm talking, this way to handle God's. So, God foresees the danger if you marry XYZ. In fact, now when I'm saying this, I'm not making any other person, uh, uh, the person who rejected me, a less spiritual person. No. It's just how God guides each heart. So we need to say things, see things objectively, because God has called each one of us for a special role. Uh, I think uh, I, I often mentioned that God has given us a talent, and God has given us a task in His kingdom. So the life partner we choose often will decide how well we take that talent and go to that place in God's kingdom and execute that task. So you know, God has. In fact, God gives us a choice, but He also knows. Who may be the best person to fit that choice? But so we need to spend time with this presence, asking God to lead us to that person. But still, we need to use our free will to choose that person. God will not choose that person for you. Okay, so God sees the danger if you marry X, Y, Z. So that's why he blocks your path. In Hosea chapter 2, he blocks the path of Israel. Uh, and So that the Israel will not continue, you know, it, it's his it's flirtatious relationship with, with several other men. Okay, all right. Now that's the the fifth fifth the fifth uh, thing I want to talk about: handling romantic rejections. Okay, God has someone for you. Okay, God has someone for you. Choose that person, even if that person is not perfect. Okay, you may have sort of come out of a romantic relationship, rejected, or maybe through circumstances out of a romantic relationship. Now you must understand: God has someone for you. And you must choose that person even if that person is not perfect. Now I can't give you a better example for this, greater illustration for this than Ruth. Now look at Ruth chapter 2. Okay, now we know we know what's happened to this woman. Okay, she married a man, man passed away and uh, probably she's thinking, why would my husband pass away? Why would I be a widow? Why would, at the, at, when I'm still young, when I'm, st I don't know how old she was, maybe 20s or 30s or 40s, we don't know. When I'm still young, why would my husband, after living with me for only 10 years, pass away? So here is a woman who is robbed of her romantic life. Okay, but look at what happens to her uh, in R Ruth chapter 2. Okay, and look at verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3. So she set out and went. So she set out and went. Okay, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was a clan of Elimelech. The Bible says it, she happened to come, which means uh, here is a woman who doesn't have a romantic relationship. Maybe she's having some hurts, but God guided her steps. The Bible says happened, but God guided her steps to the field of Boaz. And there she meets Boaz. In fact, Boaz starts to talk with her. And I can imagine a woman uh, who's been married for 10 years, okay, having experienced all the blessings marriage brings, uh, a, a, a husband uh, who's always doting over her, talking with her and, you know, making her feel special. And, uh, you know, and here is a man who's straight away doing that. <coughs> straight away, out of the blue, he's straight away doing that. Okay, I, I want to tell you how Boaz communicated with Ruth. Okay, he says, in fact, he offers a lot of tips to guys, in fact, as to how they should talk with a girl they are romantically interested in, in, in with. Okay, Boaz talked with her like a brother. Okay, if you read second chapter 8 to 14, he says, glean here in my field only. Don't go out to other fields. You know, there are other men there, you know, like a protective elder brother. You be here, don't go there. So he talked to her like a brother. And then Boaz talked to her like a mother. He was concerned if she drank water. 
sufficiently. In fact, he points it to the what place where they get water. See Ruth chapter 2, 8 to 14. I'm, I'm giving you, bringing points from there. And then Boaz talked to her like a believer. In fact, they share each other's testimony. A testimony, you know, he must have all got through loving and through inquiries about her. You know, he already knows so many things about Ruth. He's made, he has, he has made the background check, everything. He's got all the details. And I'm sure when uh, he's giving all these details and they're having this conversation, this girl is thinking, how did this man know about me? Or why does this man get, how do, why does this man, man have so many details about me? And I, I'm sure some, some feelings are going inside her heart as well. Okay, a romance is budding. And then they talked over dinner. In fact, they ate and they talked. They talked over dinner. They, he talked to her like a brother. He talked to her like a mother. He talked to her like a believer. He talked over dinner. And you know, Boaz instantly knew a woman on average speaks 13,000 words more than a man. He understood. And he was exactly, you know, giving Ruth what she loved. And a romance was budding. Now in fourth chapter, uh, you know what happens? When the man who was supposed to marry Ruth backs away, and I'm sure Ruth was so happy. Uh, in fact, according to the Old Testament law, Ruth is supposed to take out a slipper and slap that boy for refusing to marry him. Do you know that? I can give you the references. It's there in my notes. But I wanna, I'm looking at you, so I just want to keep it going with this. He's, she's supposed to have, the, the kinsman and redeemer closest to her, supposed to have married her, supposed to have taken a chapel and slapped him and spit on his face and things like that, insulted him. But I'm sure, I don't know, I was not there when this happened. I'm sure uh, if she was American culture, Ruth would have ran to this boy and gave him a tight bear hug. Thank you for saying no, because you know what? By this time, she loved Boas. Because only if this guy says no, she can marry Boaz. And that was a blessed family. From that family was born the Lord Jesus Christ. And the elders blessed them. In fact, they were a blessed family from that family. Down the line, as we see the study, the genealogy, Jesus was born. Jesus was born. Now, how did this happen? Now, Ruth, after her romantic life was robbed or by through circumstances, her husband died. Now, she moved on. So young people, I, I want to I wanna tell you, I want to I wanna appeal to you. If you have been through a romantic rejection, okay, you should not jump on another relationship on the rebound. Like a rebound you want. Okay, uh, okay well, last weekend a girl broke up with you. Next weekend you are dating another girl. No, I'm not talking about that. Not on the rebound. But, but after having taken time to understand what has gone wrong and after spending time in God's presence and after time has healed the wound okay, and don't let it not take too much time okay but down the line God there's no I can't give you a chapter and verse to uh, to tell you you must wait for five years before you start the next romantic relationship or wait for two and a half years or three years and two months no I have no Bible verse but as the Holy Spirit leads you when you're uh, don't do it on a rebound do not, don't okay one week one day you're here and the next day somebody else not like that no but after you've taken time to come out of that uh, you know of that break, breakup or whatever you had consider another person whom God may bring in your life like Boaz and Ruth uh, Ruth considered Boaz and got married but again, Boaz was not, did not have all pleasing qualities. <coughs> Boaz was much older too. In fact, the Bible records Boaz calling her daughter, which means the age gap must have been there. But it's okay. There are some things you can compromise, except the believer clause. You can compromise on things, except on non-moral issues. Okay, that doesn't mean you compromise. Okay, he's drinking, no problem. I'll marry him. Non-moral issues, you can compromise. Because what is, is uh, being old a moral issue? Is it a sin to be 42 years old? No. But so on non-moral issues, be willing to be willing to compromise. Accept the believer clause. Okay. And then uh, uh, Bo was married a widow. In fact, uh, you know, when things are like this, uh, rapes happening. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we just... We read Esther and Anuya's story, and then I have, a, I just have with me the week magazine uh, current issue uh, last Sunday, which talks about how in India, 200 girls are being sold for sex slavery every day. 
200 girls. And how girls 9 to 11, girls just entering puberty are preferred. How, you know, the rate for girls who are fair, slim and tall, fair, slim and tall, you know, if you can get some girls from some family, if you can smuggle her and give it to those uh, the red light areas of Mumbai or similar areas, you can get two lakhs. There are guys who are willing to pay two lakhs and buy that. How 200 such sale, you know, 200 such transaction go, go, goes on to our country. Now, you know, you know, why? Because men are so crazy to have sex with virgins. Let me put it so bluntly. But in a world like that, Boas was ready to marry a woman who was not a virgin. He made a compromise. Is not being a virgin a moral issue? It, it can be a moral issue, but in her case, it was not a moral issue. She was married to somebody else for 10 years. So she's not a virgin, but it's okay. That's not a main reason. You, be willing to compromise. Be willing to compromise on accept the believer clause. Accept on moral areas. And move on, move on. In fact, uh, uh, there's a last year a book was released by Joni Erickson Tata. How many of her, how many of you have heard of Joni Erickson Tata? Quadriplegic, a woman who can't, uh, who has lost all four limbs. If I can, she can't use her legs. You can't even her hands are not that strong. Uh, a, a, a Japanese history school teacher saw her in a church, sat behind her in a church during a Sunday service, and because the sermon was boring her during. A church service, I don't know, it's a Sunday service. Because the church someone was boring, he noticed this girl. Who is this handicapped girl, a physically challenged girl sitting in front of me? You know, he became interested in her. And then he 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 felt God was leading him to marry her. He's a believer, I'm a believer. What's Corinthians 739? The only non-negotiable condition the Bible has for two people to get married. That's past. That is a big tick, big big green tick mark. Okay, then there was another thing that he wanted to do. He said, okay, now I'm going to, this is American culture, American setting. So I need to go and ask her for a date. And he said, for me to qualify to ask her for the date, I need to do something. And he said, I will, I need to go to the gym. You know why? He had to lift. He had, to, he must have had the ability to, he must be, he must have the ability to lift 180 pounds. How many kgs is that? 90 kgs? About 90 kgs. I must have the ability to lift, you know, 90 kgs because that's how a wheelchair with Johnny would weigh 180 pounds. So he went to the gym and he worked, worked out, worked out, worked out. And when he was, when he had enough muscles, he went, he said, okay, he asked her for a date. And when she agreed, he lifted a wheelchair, put it in his car and took her for the date. And they've been married for now many, many years. And in fact, they wrote a, a book on this, on this success story of a marriage last year, which was released. Both are believers, both serve God. In fact, Joni has got a, a great ministry called Joni and Friends. You can Google that. Okay, not that their marriage, uh, in fact, uh, uh, that, that book sold several, several, several thousand copies, a million copies. And that, that Japanese American's name is Ken Tada. Now, here was a man clearly, you know, I'm, sure, I'm not sure what inspired him, but probably the example of Ruth and Boas inspired him. Example of Ruth and, Bo uh, Ruth and Bose inspired him. Okay, now quickly, I have two more points and I want to I want to close now. Don't rebel against God because you are rejected romantically. Don't rebel against God because you are, you are rejected romantically. Now in John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman, a Samaritan woman. And during the course of the conversation, Jesus says, The man you are living with is not your husband. And you've been with five men, which means we, the scripture is again not clear. She has been through five marriages and maybe five, five times she got married. Five times she walked out of that marriage. Either she was rejected or she rejected the man. I don't know what happened. But obviously that is not a healthy life. Till she met Jesus. Now, uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe made a statement once like this, which sort of tells a story, gives you an explanation for the kind of life that she lived in some way. She said, sometimes I feel my whole life has been one big rejection. That's what Marilyn Monroe, famous celebrity out of the United States who passed away in the age of 36, apparently committed suicide, a movie star, or a model. 
She said, my whole life has been one big rejection. And uh, she has been mad. She was married three times and divorced three times. And uh, according to some reports, reliable reports, she was even having an affair with John F. Kennedy, the, who was the president of the United States when she passed away. Extramarital relationship. She would call up John F. Kennedy's wife and say that they were having a relationship, it seems, according to a, a book which was released last year. Uh, uh, that, that's what I read. So sometimes you, you can get into the mode like, okay, okay I, I was in a relationship with this boy. This boy rejected me. And you want to take revenge on X, Y, Z after that. And you start living a morally loose life. And you now you start getting physical with boys and then you dump them and you put a Facebook update. I dumped this girl and see that uh, that girl uh, that girl becomes miserable or that boy becomes miserable and you move on to the next person. You know, that kind of rebellious life. No, don't do that. And that's why, you know, because... Uh, you might want to get revenge for your rejection, but that's not going to ultimately heal your wound. That's going to make your wound even more worse and you're going to be bleed more profusely. The book of Hebrews, uh, it talks about a root of bitterness, you know, which is which is very, very dangerous and that, that can damage you, that can damage you terribly. So you, you need to forgive that person who has unfairly rejected you romantically and ask Come to Jesus because when you come to Jesus, the gaping hole in your life left because uh, there, which is because of the romantic rejection, Jesus can fill. And not only that, Jesus can take your hand and lead you to the person you should get married if you walk with him, the right person. <coughs> so don't don't rebel, don't rebel. <coughs> and finally, finally, move on after rejection only after much introspection. Okay, in fact, I've already mentioned this. Okay, move on. Move on. Only after much introspection. In fact, some of us live in that wound for a long, long time. But the Bible says, the Bible says in the New Testament. Okay, let's can we read Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Quickly, Philippians 3, 49. Yes, I have not answered that I have made it my own. Okay. And one thing I do. Yes. Forgetting what lies behind me. Straining power to what yes. Okay. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, Paul says, I'll forget what is behind and press on towards the goal Christ Jesus has called me. In fact, if anybody forgot what was behind him, it is Apostle Paul. Because when you look at his past, his past is horrible. Because he was a persecutor of Christians, a man who persecuted Christians. In fact, I think he pulled the, the hands of women and children and a and, uh, man who was, he behaved, he was an enemy of the gospel, but he <coughs> put away all that to become a great Christian statesman. A man who wrote so many books in the New Testament. And what Paul, and in fact, Paul is talking about a spiritual life here, but he's, that is also an example for us in a in a in a romantic life. We need to forget. We need to, you know, you know, all those things. You know, practically, which means okay, everything that reminds you of that relationship, break it, throw it away. You know, if that cell phone, if you are still using the cell phone which your ex girlfriend gave you, now I would say and that that brings reminders. Throw that cell phone off. You know, delete if you're using a particular email account to chat and go and get on Gtalk with a person. You know, close that Gmail account. You know, do something drastic. Turn away. Turn away. Take a U-turn. Take a U-turn. And, uh, and 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 then 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 after introspection, move on. In fact, some people think, okay, okay, a girl has rejected me, which means everybody is going to reject me. No, that's not true. Everybody will not reject. You know. In fact, uh, uh, you should. We should not generalize. In fact, that was Peter's mistake. Peter's mistake was generalizing. In fact, Peter would not eat with Gentiles. Peter would would had a would always keep a distance from Gentiles. Why? Maybe he was in uh, something influenced him. Maybe a bad experience. Or but in fact, he Peter could not take any support from the Bible to keep away from Gentiles because the Bible says in Genesis 12:1. Through you, Abraham, I will bless all the families of the earth. So, obviously not Bible. Bible is not a support. Some prejudice he had. 
So he would keep off. He would keep off. And he would think all Gentiles are bad. Or maybe he had some rough times with some certain Gentiles. So, but then uh, God spoke to him. And God, and Peter, God spoke to him through a dream. Paul spoke to him directly, confronted him. In Galatians 2, Paul confronted him. He said, you need to change this attitude, Peter. And God spoke to him through a dream. Kill and eat, Peter. Don't call what I've called holy, unholy. And then Peter slowly learned. So if a boy rejected you, doesn't mean all the boys are bad. So if a girl rejected you, doesn't mean all the girls are bad. So take away, unlearn all those things. Take your time and then move on. Move on. And then at this juncture, uh, uh, the story from 2 Samuel 30, chapter 13 also comes to your mind. In fact, it's a horrible situation where Amnon raped his sister Tamar and after having raped her, asked her, get up and go. It's like, what happened to Esther Anuya? This man probably had sex with her and burnt her. Like, you know, can you imagine? And uh, here, this the, in Amnon, Amnon says, Amnon says to Tamar, now get up and go. We re read that story in 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 uh, in that uh, in Second Samuel thirteen, you know what? If you read that, if you Google, if you if you follow the story of Tamar in the Bible very carefully, Absalom's younger sister, Tamar lived a desolate life. Tamar, maybe there are, I don't know, through the internet or some of you here, some of you maybe Tamars, because you're not forgotten what happened to you. Was it? Maybe it was a mistake, perhaps to. Uh, I don't know who's uh, was it a mistake that she got raped I don't think so the prince raped her but is there life after rape yes there is life after rape she has to just trust God and cling on to God in in this whole wide world God would move the heart of a young man who will be willing to marry me it's also a question of trusting God and he will walk down and he will walk across my window and ask me to walk down the aisle with him in church and get married to me. You need to have faith. You need to have hope. Maybe I've gone through some rough times. Romantic rejections. Maybe I got raped during... I got raped as well. I don't know. You know what? Take time. Don't live like a tamar, like a desolate woman for the rest of your life. Move on, move on after introspection. Now, uh, I want to close here. I want to close here. I want to just offer a brief word of prayer and after which I'll open. We'll have some time for questions and questions and answers. Even as we have snack, it's 8, 10. But I just want you to close your eyes with, and I want you to think of a hymn. And I want uh, you, I want your help. And the Holy Spirit is bringing this hymn to my mind right now. Uh, this song rather popular song crucified laid behind a stone he lived to die rejected and alone Jesus was rejected so that even though you may be rejected romantically on this side of eternity he will give you the power to handle that rejection. So whomever you may be. Whatever you may have gone through. You've been through a romantic rejection. Somebody has dumped you. Somebody has left you high and dry. Weeping. I appeal to you to come to Jesus. Because he was rejected and alone. In fact. His own father. Within quotes rejected him. Because the father forsook Jesus. For a greater cause. For a greater good. That's why Jesus cried. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus was actually forsook. The father forsook Jesus. Why? Your sins and my sins were laid upon Jesus. On that day on the, when he hung on the cross. And God the father turned his face away from Jesus. Because he cannot look upon sin. And Jesus became sin for us. So that. Through that supreme act of sacrifice, we can f find forgiveness. We can find healing. The 
and uh, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now. Some of us, you know, are in a romantic relationship. And that relationship is not taking us anywhere. But just to, just because we are so scared of rejection, we give perks to our partners. We get physical with our partners. We allow our partners to touch us in places which we know they shouldn't be touching us. Why? Why? Why do we behave that way? If I don't offer this to him, he'll reject me. I want to tell, I want to tell you, young friend, let him reject you. You don't have to be in a relationship like that. First of all, it's a sin against God. Ezekiel 23 talks about the, you know, that, that kind of relationship, people who are in that kind of relationship, and how God called that whoredom, prostitution. Ezekiel 23 talks about it. You don't have to be in that kind of relationship. You don't have to get physical to keep a relationship going because you fear rejection. Come out of it. Come to Jesus. His word says, I will never reject you if you come to me. He'll embrace you. And he will heal you. In fact, yes, he can heal wounds. Yesterday night, I saw a TV show of a man who was rejected by his family, he was on the roads and he had a wound and that wound got septic and they took out, I forget, five kgs of worms on his womb, from, from that wound. The wound, wound became, the wound became septic and worms were there and he was still alive. Worms were eating away his body and he couldn't do anything about it. This man lived in a particular town in Tamil Nadu. I saw that in a TV show last night. Worms, and then a social worker was trained by Mother Teresa's ministry in Kolkata, saw him and offered to clean his, clean his wound and he took out two cages or three cages of worms from his body. You know what? Jesus can heal that kind of wound. In one word, Jesus can speak a word of healing that wound would be gone. He can do that. He also can do, do another healing. He can heal your, the wounded heart. The wounded heart. You know, you, you feel that a girl, a boy has been very, very unfair. You're thinking, why did she, why did she show me so many positive signs? You're still smarting in that wound. Come to Jesus and offer that wound to Jesus and he will dress it up. He will, he will heal it. He'll apply a balm, a balm which was produced on Calvary's cross. He'll apply that balm and heal you completely. Completely heal you. And time is also a healer. We understand that. And after that, he will lead you to the right person. A Jesus follower who is as passionate for Jesus as you are. And you both will have a good marriage. Not a trouble-free marriage. No marriage is trouble-free. But a good marriage. A marriage which is a blessing for you and blessing for others. He will lead you into that marriage. But you should not be super choosy. Don't be super choosy. Allow the Holy Spirit to help you decide to make some compromises. Apart from the believer clause. If it's a non-moral issue. He's shorter than me. He's older than me. He's, uh, he's, he's fat. He's extra weight. All those reasons. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you that freedom in <coughs> spirit. To overlook And I've not mentioned one reason why we get rejected. Sometimes we get rejected romantically because out of we have overestimated how well we look. I'm sorry, it, it looks so very blunt, it looks unvarnished, but that's the truth. You know, we don't need the Bible to understand that. Some of, sometimes we probably reach far reach to a beautiful person and we, we, we have not looked at ourselves in the mirror and we, we want to reach to a super beautiful person without even reflecting on ourselves. The Spirit of God gives us a sound mind. Allow the Spirit to work in, in your heart and give you a sound mind. A sound mind which tells you, no, this is a, this is a stupid choice you are, you are making. It's a stupid choice you're making. Do you want a, a wife which the whole world will talk about as beautiful? 
Or do you want someone who will love you just the way you are? What is your priority? That the Holy Spirit drives sense in you. Uh, ask, the, ask the Spirit of God to speak to you right now. And, and right now, many of you, uh, God has brought you for this Bible study to equip you to counsel many friends who are going through rejection. So may I ask you to remember John 6.37 Him that comes to me, my, by no means I will reject them. Words of Jesus. No, John 10.10 10 and John 6.37 These two verses you can quote and you can witness in your corporate office. John 10.10 10, I have come to give you life, life to the full. Without Jesus, life will be empty. You may drive the biggest car and have the fattest salary. Life will be empty without Jesus. And Rejection is a common experience. Romantic rejection is very common. If you meet a friend like that, you can say that I, I serve a Jesus who will reject nobody. And when you come to him, he will lead you to somebody who will be willing to walk the road of life with you following Jesus. You can wrap the gospel around a rejection experience, romantic rejection experience. So God is challenging you to do that right now. Will you tell the Lord, Lord, I'm available for this ministry? How many of you will say, I'm available for this ministry? I want you to raise your hand to the skies and say, Lord, I'm available for this ministry of ministering to the hurt, people who are hurting around me, my cousins, my, my colleagues, my neighbors, who are all rejecting, uh, who are all smarting out of a hurt they have faced in the romantic life. I'm willing to reach out to them with the gospel. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for speaking to us from your word as to how we can handle romantic rejections. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless these words of mine like you bless the five loaves and two fish and multiply it so that it heals the hearts of the troubled. It also inspires, Lord, the Google generation to use the opportunity of Romantic rejection to share the gospel and lead many to the knowledge of salvation. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.